All right. What a joy to bring the word of God to you tonight. You know, one of the most powerful descriptions of Jesus' entry into the world is as the bringer of light, dispelling and driving out the deep, deep darkness that had gripped the world. What a dark world Jesus came into. Life, human life, so cheaply. The Colosseums, the way the world was, the darkness in the world that had gripped people's lives and souls. And that's why John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, gave this prophecy about the child who was soon to be born. He declared, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high shall visit us. Wow, what an amazing image that is. The day spring from on high has come. You see, when Jesus entered the world, the darkness was pushed back. The light has arrived. And Matthew, the writer of the first gospel, reminds us that Jesus' coming would fulfil the ancient prophecy spoken by Isaiah, who said, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Hallelujah. And Jesus' coming into the world marvellously fulfilled that prophecy of Isaiah. And that's why in the book of Revelation, his work and his very being are described in this way. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star, he says. You know, that, this image of us moving from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light is at the very heart of the gospel. It is what salvation is really all about. Paul says this, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his own dear son. Hallelujah. Peter declares, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Wow. Wow. And Jesus uses this same imagery to describe himself and his ministry as he walked and lived among us. He says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. And then he calls, get this friends, he calls his followers to also be the light of the world to others. You, then he says, you are. My followers, my disciples, my friends, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You see, friends, this is how Jesus desires us to live, in the light, to know and experience freedom, love, joy, and what? Abundant. Not just life, but abundant life. And then he desires us to experience that and to share that light and that life with other people. That's his desire and destiny for you, for me, for all of us, and for the world. I am the light of the world. No restrictions. Unfortunately for too many of us, you know, from personal experience, you know this, that the reality and tragedy is that for too long sections of his church, the very representation of Christ on earth, have believed and spread a message about the nature of human sexuality that has kept people living hidden lives in the darkness. Despite being fearfully and wonderfully made, we just heard those words, didn't we? Created by the same Father who loves diversity and has filled the earth with diversity, we have lived in darkness and in shame, often with self-loathing, Self-hatred, feelings of unworthiness and fear, often suffering despair, depression, anxiety, the dark things that Jesus came to release us from, and sometimes even self-harm. These interpretations of scripture have resulted in so many living, hidden lives in the darkness, experiencing isolation, inner turmoil. And this message from the church that a person's deepest inclination to love someone of the same sex is somehow sinful or perverted or broken has also kept many people from serving Jesus and his church with the beautiful gifts that they've been given and tragically prevented them through man-made rules and judgment and exclusion 
from being the light to others. See, it's not them just suffer. What is robbed is their opportunity to be the light to others. Brothers and sisters, this experience is the very opposite of the light, life of light and freedom that Jesus came in the world to give us, that is at the very heart of his message. This message is the opposite of what Jesus shared and lived every day, dispelling the darkness, setting people free, making love the supreme command, the new measure for the way that we live and interact with God and each other. That's the measure now, not the rules. Love is the measure. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. That's the whole law now Jesus declared. The whole law. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as yourself. And they killed him for that radical new message of love. They nailed him to a cross for that message. So tonight, friends, at this very special event, this historic moment, I believe, historic moment for the Salvation Army in Australia, wherever you are listening in the world, and I know there's people all over the world listening right now, I want to share with you tonight very simply and very clearly the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is good news for the world and for everyone in it, no matter your sexuality, no matter the colour of your skin, no matter what your social economic status is, no matter your past, no matter what disabilities you carry, no matter what circumstances life has placed you in, we're all included. Hallelujah. And this is the message. This is the message of an army of salvation. The whole world redeeming. So rich and so free, our founder declared. And I want to share this life-giving message with you tonight by looking at the context and the circumstances of potentially the most beautiful and inclusive and significant words that Jesus ever spoke. Now, most of you know it by heart. I'd say it would be perhaps the most used and loved verses in Scripture. The first verse that I think I learned to recite from memory as a junior soldier, John 3... 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Amen. Well, the church loves these words, doesn't it? It uses them constantly. He writes them in signs and banners, I see proclaims them in brochures and pamphlets that are handed out on the street. But friends, in too many places, the church has limited and restricted their application. So tonight, I want you to hear Jesus again speaking these words into your life and your situation. And I want you to look at the context in which Jesus speaks these momentous words. Now, remember that John, the gospel writer, who shares this story and this encounter and these words with us, describes how Jesus was meeting in the middle of the night, in the darkness, with Nicodemus, a man whose understanding of God had influenced every aspect of his life and actions. Now remember, Nicodemus wasn't just a believer in Jehovah and the Torah. He had signed up to become a strict Pharisee, a devoted religious teacher and leader committed to keeping and enforcing every Jewish religious rule and the setting of night and darkness in which they meet matched the darkness that Nicodemus must have sensed was in his own soul. You see, despite his position, despite his strict observance of the law, to come to Jesus that night in this way, Nicodemus must have sensed somewhere deep down in his soul that he'd got it all wrong, that the legalism the ideas that he devoted his life to was not the complete answer, that he'd missed something important. And Nicodemus is so afraid and so embarrassed to admit this that he comes to Jesus when? In the dead of night, when the crowds are gone. So no one knows that deep down he's harbouring these doubts and fears. You see, even though outwardly Nicodemus proclaimed to have the light, the rules and burden of a system he is part of means he's hiding in the darkness, like so many of us have been. And Jesus that night has this amazing conversation with Nicodemus about change. Or we could read John 3 tonight 
and would thrill you. You must be born again, he says to Nicodemus. You must receive a new heart, Nicodemus, a new attitude. You must get a new understanding of God and who he really is. And then he says the Spirit's at work in the world. The Spirit's going to be present to help you make it possible. He's moving in new ways in the world, he says. You can't tell where he is. You think you've got it all worked out, he says, but he's at work in new ways in the world. Oh, Nicodemus must have been, you know, like staggered. What fear and anxiety these words must have struck in Nicodemus's heart. How, at this stage of his life, could he start again, do things differently, believe a different doctrine? Oh, and then... Here, this, in the middle of this very deep theological conversation about change and who God really is, Jesus says this to Nicodemus. And I wonder whether he reached out and looked him in the eyes and put his hand on his shoulder. But he says to Nicodemus the words that have probably become the most well-known and loved in the Bible. He says, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he said his one and only son, For God didn't send the world, his son, to condemn the world, but to save it. Oh, you see, Jesus was saying to Nicodemus as he struggled with all these new ideas and all that it would mean for him personally for the rest of his life, he was saying to him, I love you, Nicodemus. I'm God. I love you. I've come into this world for you, Nicodemus. And friends, he says those same words to you and me again tonight. To all who live in darkness and all who need the light of God and salvation, that's what he says to you tonight. Oh, some of us have heard him repeat those words in the darkest moments of our life, haven't we? When we battled with the false doctrine that said we weren't acceptable to him, that we were perverted, that we were broken, that we needed to be fixed. Some of us have heard his gentle voice just like Nicodemus did that night, saying to us, I love you. I created you as you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I am with you. Captain Chris Halliday, won't mind me saying this, recently shared his personal story on Major Bryce Davies' Stories of Hope's podcast. I hope you listen to it. If you haven't listened to it, go and listen to it. I spent most of my time in tears listening to it, but after experiencing multiple rejections by our army, Despite his strong call to officership and ministry, by man-made rules and exclusion, and being told by one senior officer, someone like you will never be a Salvation Army officer. He tells in his own words how, after spending a long period in dark places, with strong voices telling him to give his faith away, it all came to a head one night, he says, as he was walking alone on a beach on the Gold Coast. And in his own words on that podcast, he relates what happened. I had this credible interaction with God the Father, Chris says. Just an incredible one of those once-in-a-lifetime moments when I was walking on the beach late at night and I actually heard the audible voice of God and felt the presence of the Holy Spirit around me. And I heard God say, just what he said to Nicodemus is what he heard him say, I love you. I created you. I'm sorry for what's happened. It's time to come back. And Chris tells in his story that was the beginning of his path back to fighting again for his destiny and his calling that God had always had for you, Chris, and which you live out so beautifully today. Friends, after decades of living a lie, living in darkness, trying to change the person God had made me to be time and time and time and time again through prayer, therapy, exorcism, all manner of conversion treatments and practices both here in Australia and overseas without success. After my marriage was finally irreparably broken and over and I was living alone for the first time in my life in a four-bedroom quarters on the Salvation Army Training College site in Bexley North. Terribly lonely, isolated through COVID, unable to connect with people. The darkness was strong and deep. It was 2 or 3 a.m. and I wasn't able to sleep. 
The enemy of my soul was telling me I was a hypocrite, a fraud, a failure in ministry and as a father. My officership was in ruins. Everything I'd given my life for and to seemed to be at an end that night. Your life is over, that voice of condemnation and accusation screamed into my heart. And as I gathered together all my antidepressant medication, praying if I took it all at once, it might bring finally peace to my soul and release me from this torment and shame and darkness. That night, in the early hours of the morning, in my room, I heard for the first time in my life the audible voice of Jesus. Just as Nicodemus did in his darkness, just as Chris did on the beach that night, and Jesus whispered to me that same message, piercing the darkness with words of love and grace. I love you, Paul. I heard him say these words, I formed you in your mother's womb. I created you with all your feelings and emotions and inclinations. I've always been with you. It's time to accept the truth. I will restore you and give you back what the enemy has taken. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your mercy. And friends, my life has changed since that night. The shame and darkness that coexisted in me for years is gone. I live in new freedom and understanding of God's indescribable love and grace. And I thank those leaders of this army that I love and have given my life to, many of whom are in this room tonight, who have affirmed that voice of Jesus speaking life and light into my soul. You see, like my friend Chris and so many in this room, I finally heard and believed that message of grace and inclusion and acceptance that Jesus spoke that night to Nicodemus in his darkness and all of us. But friends, I say this to you, I grieve for those for whom the darkness is so powerful. The messages are so internalised and deep in our souls. The enemy is so strong in his condemnation that they can't hear the words and voice of Jesus like I did, like Chris did. And you know what? We, his people, his church, are meant to be the voice of Jesus to them at those times. We are called to be his hands, his feet, dispelling the darkness, the light of the world he called us to be, speaking love and acceptance. But too often his church has failed and given a very different message. Oh God, forgive us for that and renew our army, and recall us to this Nicodemus message of light and hope and unlimited grace and boundless love for all. I think of all the young people who have heard a different gospel, a different message that has sent many into the darkness, that has driven many away from the church and even cost some their lives. That was my experience as a young man growing up in this army, wrestling with what I was taught was a perverted and unacceptable way of living or being. And those messages have kept part of me living in hiding and in darkness all these years and caused hurt to so many of those I love the most. Salvation Army, we must change. As the darkness of the church's justification and defence of slavery and racism has been overturned by the Spirit of God. And the darkness of keeping women in subordinate roles that prevented them from using their amazing gifts in leadership to grow his kingdom of light. As this too has been exposed as a lie of the enemy, so too the day has come when his church, led by his spirit, must overcome this darkness also and create a place for freedom and light for all God's children, regardless of who they love and want to serve with and be united to. We have to do it. There is another generation of Chris and Pauls and others for whom this issue is real right now. They are living it right now. We cannot delay. I follow Salvation Army office, former Salvation Army officer and leader Chick Yule's posts on Facebook, who incidentally has a lot of prophetic words to say to us on this issue. And tomorrow uh, we'll be looking at some of his contributions and you'll be blessed by that. He currently works as a radio presenter in the UK and he has a show called Faith, Hope and Love. 
Now recently, if you follow him on Facebook, the topic of his radio program was the experience of an Anglican church in the UK that embarked on a journey of being an intentionally inclusive church after the church faced a tragedy when a young woman who was part of their congregation took her own life because she was gay and couldn't tell anyone. That church now welcomes LGBTQI plus people into full membership, into leadership. They will hire LGBTQI plus people for any ministry role, provided they are suitably qualified and called to that position. So this is Chick uh, telling us about that. And Chick asked his Facebook followers that uh, day to share their experiences with him and if they agreed with this approach. That's what he put out there, because he wanted some background stuff for his show. Now, one of the respondents to that request was a Salvation Army officer and a mother from the UK, Vivian Prescott. She's given me permission to share her response with you tonight. This beautiful officer shared this on her post. My youngest son is gay, raised in a Christian home but actively part of the church. He had heard all the traditional teaching. One evening I walked past his bedroom door and I heard him sobbing. He was about 16 at the time. I walked in to find him on his knees on the floor, praying and begging, begging God to take his gayness away. It was unbearable to see. I got on the floor with him while he cried out to God. I silently prayed for God to come close, for God to show my boy who he was in his eyes, how beautiful he is and acceptable just as God made him to be. Why would a loving father ignore the cries of one of his children? I don't believe he would, not the loving, perfect God I worship. My boy got off the floor that night as gay as when he had fallen to his knees. But at peace with who God made him to be. And it changed me forever too. I'm so grateful. As a Salvation Army officer, I am committed to pray and work for the movement I am part of to be inclusive. I have been on a journey with my tradition and scripture and my heart and mind say, whosoever will may come. Amen, Vivian Prescott. As I read those words, this act of love, at this critical moment in this young man's life, brought me to tears. As I thought back, why couldn't my mother or my church have said that to me when I was 16 years of age and doing exactly the same thing that Vivian Prescott's son was doing by my bed night after night after night, begging God to take it away, pleading for God to fix me and rescue me from this abomination that I'd been told. But the shame was so great I couldn't share that journey with anyone, so I decided to live in darkness. And when I read this post only a few weeks ago, I felt compelled to write back to Vivian. And so I wrote these words, Vivian Prescott, you were truly the voice and the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus that night to your son. And he heard the heart of Jesus to him. Hallelujah. Oh, that we may be the voice of Jesus to all on a similar journey. Speaking above the voices of prejudice and the pain of rejection, I love you. I created you. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. I left heaven and went all the way to Calvary for you. You are my precious child. O oh, Salvation Army, people of God, you get it, don't you? We must be the light for Jesus today, pushing back the darkness, setting the prisoner free, speaking the Nicodemus message to the world. When people can't hear or feel anything but the darkness of shame, the pain of rejection and the cruel words of hatred, when the voice of the destroyer of our soul is loud, we must be the voice of Jesus to them. This is why people leave the church and faith and sometimes take their own lives. It is the work of Satan to keep people in darkness, make them live under condemnation, injure the body of Christ by robbing it of these beautiful gifts that the enemy knows if released would bring life and light to so many more people. Oh, we have to be Jesus, who never once spoke about homosexuality, never once uttered a word of condemnation 
to those who are attracted to members of their own sex. Why is that, I wonder? Why his silence? You know why? Because he dealt with this issue once and for all. When he said to Nicodemus that day, God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whosoever believes in me shall have life. He dealt with it when he modelled love and acceptance and inclusion to those whose society rejected and thought little of and discriminated against. The woman at the well, the hated tax collector Zacchaeus, Mary Magdalene, the man with mental illness living in the cemetery, the woman caught committing adultery, the hated Roman oppressors even, the lepers and the disabled, the tax collectors, the children who thought no one was important. He embraced and welcomed them all. That's why. Dare I suggest it's a high probability that there were some same-sex attracted people amongst that crowd. But Jesus didn't signal this issue out because they were all included in his life-giving gospel. It's for the whosoever. Salvationists and friends, that's the gospel that will dispel the darkness, that will bring life and light. That's what we are called to be. Jesus had nothing to say about homosexuality, but he had an awful lot to say about judging others about burdening people and imprisoning them with man-made rules and legalism. Our mission, our calling in this world is city judgment or condemnation or think we can determine who is in, who is out of God's kingdom of grace and love. Our calling is what? Simply to love. Simply to love. Our mission is just to do and be what St. Francis of Assisi so beautifully expressed. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved, as to love with all my heart. Well, here is the task ahead for us, Salvation Army, to live like that. As a young person struggling with these unspeakable conflicts, I grew up singing this worship song. Brother, let me be your servant. Do you remember it, some of you? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are brothers on the road. We are here to help each other. Walk the mile and bear the load. You know, I love the sentiments this song expressed. I wanted to do this so much for others. And eventually I gave my life to that great purpose, like Scott did, like Chris did. It captures your heart, that sort of vision, doesn't it? Being that in our world. But even though I sang these words, I failed to realise that I desperately needed someone to do this for me too. I now know what that song really represents because when I was 60 years of age last year and finally had the courage to reach out of my darkness longing for light and truth people like Chris Halliday and Greg Whitaker and Brad Watson and Miriam Lewis and Colin Daly and Jonathan Browning and Mitch Evans and Mitchell Stevens and Jenny Beeger and my amazing children Nathan and Sarah did this for me were this to me were Jesus to me I understand these words and I sing them differently now because that's what I need in myself and now that's what I want to do for others. For the rest of my life, I will hold the Christ light for you. In the night time of your fear, I will hold my hand out to you. Speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. Brother, let me be, sister, gender, gender fluid, whatever. Let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. When I'm broken, when I'm in darkness, when I need that voice of Jesus. Oh, that's what inclusion looks like. Never judging, simply serving each other in love. Well, can I say to you, I have experienced that in these last few months. And I promise you tonight, it casts out doubt, no, darkness, it casts out fear, and it floods your soul with light and peace. Friends, Commissioner John Gowans, one of my heroes, 
used to say, we are all called to be little Christ. Remember his sermons about that? We are called to be little Christ. Oh, that's what will change our army in the world. So tonight, as I conclude, there are two invitations I make for the army and to you who are attending this forum, whether you're here in the room or sitting somewhere in another part of the world or in your home, two invitations. To those here or listening online who haven't heard the voice of Jesus telling you how much you are loved and valued by your maker, just as you are, then hear it tonight, please. He loves you. He left heaven and he entered our world and became the suffering servant, just like us. So you would know how much you are loved and how much you are valued. So you would know how deeply he understands our human condition. He understands our struggles. He's walked the human road. He's the Christ of the human road. He longs for you tonight to move out of the darkness into his glorious light. If you've never heard that message, if you've never received his grace and salvation tonight before, friends, hear it tonight. You are intensely loved. And tonight we want to pray words of light and words of life over you. Oh, friends, let me say, how many times have I come to this mercy seat, this place of prayer in all Salvation Army halls around the world, based on a teaching that I needed to plead with God at that place to miraculously cure me, to seek forgiveness for my horrible thoughts and my horrible feelings, when all I really needed was someone to come alongside me and tell me I was loved and valued just as I was. So tonight there is an invitation just to receive his beautiful gift of love and mercy and salvation, a costly gift, but a beautiful gift, to encounter for yourself amazing grace, to have someone pray, these words of life over you for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you so you come tonight the Holy Spirit is gently touching your heart drawing to you to your saviour someone's going to pray life and light into your life and the second invitation is for salvationists and Christian friends. Here are multiple candles, symbols of light in the darkness. If God the Holy Spirit is convicting you to join us on this campaign, to push back the darkness in people's lives through an inclusive message of love and grace, if you hear a call tonight to be a light in your world, will you come and symbolise that response by lighting a candle as a symbol of your willingness and your commitment to see the kingdom of light dawn in people's lives, in his church, in his army, and in our world. You know, I believe that one day, very soon, all these individuals, candles and lights are going to merge into a powerful, unstoppable, cleansing, burning flame. You like that? Cleansing. <laughs> Do you like that? Cleansing, burning flame that will change and renew our army and signal a new day of grace for all God's children. Will you light and add your small flame tonight? If you're in your homes and you go and find a candle somewhere, I invite you to go and do that right now. Go and find a candle. Symbolically light your candle tonight and join us here in this beautiful core amongst these beautiful people. Together, salvationists, followers of Jesus, let's push back the darkness. And friends, pray as you do that God will lead you to that one soul still trapped in darkness and lies. It's fine to do it for the world, but find that one person. Lead me to some soul today. One soul. One person who needs to feel and see that true message that Jesus shared with Nicodemus all those centuries ago that delivered him from years of legalism. You know the journey Nicodemus must have taken? He was a strict Pharisee. Jesus turned his world upside down and delivered him into a new place. Well, he'll do the same for you tonight. So find that person, that one, who you can share that message with. May God help us to be the people he has called us to be. But you are a chosen people. 
a royal priesthead, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Hallelujah. Fire a volley, eh? Amen. So now this is God's time for his spirit to do his beautiful work amongst us. You come and pray at the mercy seat if you need to, and we'll pray with you and speak life and light into your life. Well, come and light a candle, but be obedient to his leading and his loving voice, I pray. As you respond to the Holy Spirit's work tonight, we're going to listen to some beautiful words that summarise and really reinforce everything I have said tonight. I chose and I love this song because it recognises that sometimes the truth is it takes a while for this message of grace and inclusion to penetrate the deep darkness. It takes a while for it to refute the lies and the false messages that we've been told or heard so many times. So tell it to me one more time, the songwriter pleads. Tell me, do you really understand that God loves you and made you for the pleasure of knowing you? Oh, friends, that's the truth. It's the gospel of good news that I proclaim as his minister tonight. O oh, triune God, may that message tonight penetrate and scatter and defeat every dark thought, every lie of the enemy. May grace and love conquer in our hearts just as it did on Calvary. And may we, filled with your light, Lord, and your love and the Holy Spirit, become the light of the world for others. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tell it to me one more time that God loves you. You come, light a candle, pray at the mercy seat. It's God's time. Well, we want to say a, a really heartfelt thank you to everybody who's participated in any way tonight. Whether by all the preparation that's gone in, or actually the heartfelt sharing or the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you. It's quite strange for me standing here. I've got some mixed emotions. You see, in 2014, General Andre Cox appointed me to be the chair of the International Moral and Social Issues Council. One of the first things that I had to do as the chair of that international group was uh, propose an agenda of work to the general for the International Salvation Army in the area of moral and social issues. And we worked together and we prayed together and we made a bold proposal to the general and said that it was well past time that the Salvation Army worldwide began to talk about the thing we never talked about, human sexuality. And so the International Moral and Social Issues Council, for the first time in the Army's history, partnered with the International Theological Council, began to work through, discuss and pray through how that might take place in a safe way around the Salvation Army. And as a result of all of that work, a whole series of resources called Let's Talk were produced and uh, an enormous number of people have been trained in faith-based facilitation that these conversations might happen in a healthy and a safe way. That was 2014. So I'm here with mixed emotions. Because this is the first event I've ever been to. So there's a part of me that's really glad. And there's a part of me that cries out, that was 2014. But, you know, I'm one of those persona non grata people these days, you know. I'm a white, male, straight, married, 
60 years of age and in a leadership position. I'm one of them. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I'm not sorry, I'm married. <laughs> If I'm disappointed that it's taken eight years to get from that place to here, for many of you who have been waiting most of your lives, I simply can't imagine. Welcome. And all I ask is that whoever takes part in these facilitated conversations, that the love that's been spoken about so beautifully tonight infuse it all, and that this be the safest place within the Salvation Army for these con conversations to take place. Jay's going to pray. It's been wonderful to be with you. Let's join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, creator of all, you, Lord, who scattered the stars and placed the moon and sun, created birds to soar, and those amazing creatures found in the depths of the ocean, and really where more than in the continent of this great country of Australia can we see those magnificent creatures. You looked at your creation and you called it good, and it is you, God, who formed humanity with the same joy and care that birthed the rest of creation. And we rejoice that each here are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. We affirm here tonight that all people are endowed with inherent dignity and worth and that we are called to treat each other in ways that honour and value that worth. Lord, we acknowledge our humanness in wanting to give labels to each other. But you, Lord, called us beloved. Remind us to say this repeatedly until we believe it. We are beloved. We are beloved. And Father God, we are called to resist all forms of injustice. And we acknowledge with great grief that often the lives and rights and freedom of people has not been valued in our communities and our society. Guide, Lord, we pray, the Salvation Army toward an enduring justice. Give us the courage to reconcile with those who have been harmed by us. And we ask your blessing as we seek to do our part in this world to free people from injustice, violence, and discrimination. We are, all of us, called by love for the sake of love to be love wherever we are and in all the world. Continue to create us to be your beloved people. Amen. <laughs>